Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here tonight for our Sunday night service. Welcome to those that are maybe watching online at home. We're going to start by singing our first hymn of the evening. It's number 613, Singing I Go. Let's sing it out unto the Lord this morning. Number 613, Singing I Go. The trust. 
trusting heart to Jesus clings, nor any ill forebode. But at the cross of Calvary sing, praise God for lifted loads. Singing I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along life's road, for Jesus has lifted my load. Passing days bring many cares, fear not, I hear him say. And when my fears are turned to prayers, the burdens slip away. Singing I go along my stroll, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along my stroll, for Jesus has lifted my load. Let's sing it out on the third verse. He tells me of my Father's love and never slumbering I. My everlasting King above will all my needs supply. Singing I go along my stroll, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along my stroll, for Jesus has been when to the throne of grace I flee, I find the promise true. The mighty arms upholding me will bear my burdens too. Singing I go along my stroll, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing I go along my stroll, for Jesus has lifted my load. Let's open up with a word of prayer and ask for the Lord's blessings on our service tonight. Let's pray. Father above, we thank you so much for uh, the ability to worship again tonight, to assemble together as your people. And Lord, we uh, just thank you for the privilege it is to study and preach your word. We look forward to the time spent that you would edify us, you would build us up, you would encourage our hearts. Lord, thank you for the faithful members of our congregation that uh, desire to grow in their walk with you and grow in our service to you. And I pray that this meeting, you would meet with us in a special way and that you would be honored and glorified by all that's said and done. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, let's sing our next hymn this evening, number 165, When We See Christ. Let's sing it out together this evening, When We See Christ. Be 
all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Good singing. You may be seated. All right. Thank you, Brother Rob, for helping out there. Amen. Well, it will be worth it all. Amen. It's worth it to follow Christ, to serve Christ. And we're thankful that one glorious morning we'll arise to be with him. Uh, so sometimes we think of either one day we'll, we'll pass away and go to heaven, but there'll be that generation that'll be raptured to be caught up in the air to meet him. The trumpet will sound. What a day that will be. And all the trials of this life will seem as nothing, won't they? Pandemics, 2020, and the years of toil and, and hardships in our own personal lives will seem as nothing when we see Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Well, so happy and thankful you're joining us tonight. You know, someone told me that there's a protest happening on Elmont Road uh, this evening. And, of course, there's protests happening all over the country. Um, I say I, I come to church to protest uh, systemic uh, demonic a demonic sin that's what I'm coming to protest I'm, I'm coming to protest systemic uh, demon worship and demonism and that's what I'm coming to protest I, I want to see the Satan, Satan and the, the enemy vanquished and pushed back I want to see the gospel advance forward and that's why we come to church amen? amen and so we we thank God for all that he's doing in our church and our lives and uh, thankful that his testimony his cause goes on um, I do want to just keep reminding us to be praying Pray for Brother David. Uh, he's there in England now, and he shared a message with me uh, yesterday that he's doing well, getting acclimated. And of course, we're praying for many of our families in our church. I've tried to kind of get a sense of what many of the families are going to be going through. You know, some of them uh, have to figure out what they're going to do with work and school and how they're going to get the kids to school and all that good stuff. Um, so it's going to be a real struggle for a lot of families. So you be, you be in prayer that God gives wisdom, God gives direction, God gives guidance. Uh, I'm praying that the cases really stay down and things can really get back to normal soon. I really can't see if the kids can't go back to school and people can't go to work. I mean, it, everything is just going to come to a screeching halt. And like it or not, uh, things like uh, an economy really do matter in our lives. Think about the infrastructure of our city. Uh, it takes money. It takes money for you to support your families. It takes money for the work of the ministry to go forward. And so these are important things that we should be praying about. And so we're trusting the Lord. We know he has a purpose. We know he has a plan. Um, but that being said, let's collect our offering for tonight. I'm going to ask our men if they would come. I'm going to switch up to up here. But let's be ready for our offering this evening. Let's remember to keep our church finances in prayer. Remember to pray for our missionaries specifically. Think of some of the hardships many of them are going through, especially financially at this time as well. And so let's be praying that God uses our, our church, each of us, to be a channels of blessings to continue seeing his work advance. Now let's pray for this evening's offering. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much that you have blessed us, Lord, with uh, just the unspeakable riches, Lord, that we think of all the riches that we enjoy spiritually, Lord, the peace that passes understanding, joy unspeakable, full of glory. Lord, we have the, our refuge that's in you in a world that is uh, so anxious, in a world that is always constantly uh, looking for something, searching for something that they don't even really know what. Uh, Lord, thank you Lord, that we have a haven of rest in Christ. And Lord, thank you that you even meet our physical needs, Lord. You, you ask us to pray each day that you would give us our daily bread, our daily provision. We do pray that you would keep providing for each and every one of our families. I pray that this year you would give them wisdom. As many of the children have to figure out what they'll do with school and how parents will get to work, we pray you would just give them wisdom, give them the open door, encourage them, Lord. Uh, we pray for our church finances. Thank you, Lord, that you continue to meet the need. And would you keep using uh, the faithful giving of your people so that we can get the gospel out, not only here in Elmont, but also around the world through all our various missionaries. And so we just pray for your blessings on this offering tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Let's take our Bibles tonight and we'll be in Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4, we're moving right along here in our series through this uh, historical writing of Ezra. And tonight we're going to be in chapter number 4. Start reading in verse 1. The Bible says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esar Hadon, the king of Asher, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of their letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian language. Rehum, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, and his sword. Then wrote Rehum, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, the Denites, the Aparecites, the Tarpalites, the Aphrosites, the Archivites, the Babylonians, the Susankites, the Dehavites, and the Elamites. Almost like Elmontites, right? <laughs> Verse 10. And the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Asper brought over and set in the cities of Samaria, and the rest that are on this side of the river, and at such a time, this is the copy of of the letter that they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king, thy servants, the men on this side of the river, and at such a time. Be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are come unto Jerusalem, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded and the walls set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt and damage the revenue of the kings. Now because we have maintenance from the king's palace, and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore have we sent and certify the king, that search may be made in the book of the records of thy fathers, so shalt thou find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful unto kings and provinces and that they have moved sedition within the same of old time for which cause was this city destroyed. We certify the king that if this city be builded again and the walls thereof set up by this means thou shalt have no portion on this side of the river. Then sent the king an answer unto Rehum the chancellor and to Shimshai uh, the scribe and to the rest of their companions that dwell in Samaria and unto, the rest, and unto the rest beyond the river, peace and at such a time. The letter which he sent unto us hath been plainly read before me. And I commanded and search hath been made and it is found that this city of old time hath made insurrection against kings and that rebellion and sedition had been made therein. There have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem, which have ruled over all countries beyond the river, and told tribute and custom was paid unto them. Give ye now commandment 
to cause these men to cease, and that this city be not builded until another commandment shall be given from me. Take heed now that ye fail not to do this. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and made them to cease by force and power. Then ceased the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Let's stop here and let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can open up your word and uh, read some of these uh, real historical events that took place in the life of your people Israel. And Lord, you told us that these are given for our examples. And so I pray that by your spirit, you help us to understand what took place all those years ago. Uh, also, you allow us to make application even to our current situations today. Pray that you would fill me and empower me. And I pray that you would work in the hearts of all of your people tonight. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Here in Ezra chapter number four, we're looking at delaying the work of God. Delaying the work of God. One Bible commentator said, from this point onwards, right to the end of Nehemiah, there's conflict. Nothing that is attempted for God will now go unchallenged. And scarcely a tactic be unexplored by the opposition. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And the lesson that we can learn here is that if you are going to make a decision to serve the Lord, if you are going to make a decision to be bold in your testimony, to support the Lord and to support the Lord's work, mark it down. You can set your clock to it almost. There will be opposition. You can mark it down. Whenever any of God's people is gathered together to carry out the work of God, there will be opposition. We shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't let that be a shock to us. And I, I mentioned earlier this morning uh, some of the opposition that many churches sadly are facing all across America. And perhaps we have been bamboozled into thinking that it would never happen here in America. But, oh, we shouldn't be surprised at all. In fact, I'm convinced if you follow the cultural trends, I'm talking about things like the LGBTQ movement, uh, the tolerance movement, which is really intolerant towards biblical Christianity, the coming generations are going to have to make a decision, and it might cost them something. It might cost them positions at work to take a stand for truth. It might cause churches to losing their tax-exempt status or losing other maybe privileges or things that maybe churches previously enjoyed, all in opposition to the work of God. It shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't shock us. But you know what? When opposition comes, don't fret. Don't fret because you're in good company, actually. You're in good company like the Israelites. You're in good company like Ezra. You're in good company like the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, his ministry was opposed. Men like the Apostle Paul and Peter and the other disciples. So we're in good company when we face opposition. And by the way, regarding this opposition, we must note that Satan cannot defeat the work of God. He cannot defeat the work of God. He may only delay the work of God. That's the very best that he can do. And by the way, even a delay is really according to God's timetable. But the best that Satan can try to do is to delay God's work. God's work can never be thwarted. God's work can never be undone. It continues, it goes on. But in this passage, the source of opposition, remember the Israelites are returning back from slavery and captivity in Babylon, and they're returning back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, rebuild the altar, the place of dedication and forgiveness of sin and God's presence. They're rebuilding all of that, reclaiming all of that in accordance to God's will. But in this passage, there's opposition, the Bible says, that comes from the people of the land, the Bible says, the people of the land. Well, who are these people of the land? You'll remember that the most of the Jews were taken away in captivity and slavery to Babylon. People like Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They were taken, even children taken. But there were some people that were left behind. 
If you remember when we studied 2 Kings, the Bible talked about how there was a, a remnant that was kind of the, the, the poor, uh, the, the neglected class of people that uh, the Babylonians just simply left there. They said they weren't worth taking, taking to Babylon. They simply left them there. And so they were, they were there uh, in exile, staying there in, in Jerusalem and Judea. There were also people that drifted into this land of Judea. So the southern kingdom was conquered by Babylon. The northern kingdom was conquered by which nation? Anyone remember? Assyria. And so we see Assyria mentioned here. Asher or Assyria is mentioned here. And the Assyrians had a different strategy. When they conquered a land, they uprooted you from that land, took you to their, wherever they wanted you to go in their empire. But they would also repopulate that land and just bring in foreign groups of people into that land. So in the northern and the formerly northern tribes, there was these repopulated groups, pagan groups, and they eventually drifted down to Judea as well, of course. And so they assimilated, repopulated this area, and these are who we would now refer to as the Samaritans. So these are the early origins of the Samaritans. And we know the Samaritans continue as a people through the New Testament times. We read a lot about them in the New Testament times. But these people clearly here were not happy. These early Samaritans were unhappy that Jeru uh, Judah and Benjamin are now returning back to this land and rebuilding this temple and the city of Jerusalem. And so thus they were adversaries right here from the very beginning. And of course the Samaritans, we read about them in the New Testament. And because the Samaritans had some type of connection to the people of Israel. Remember, they were kind of an intermingled, mixed multitude there. They had this hodgepodge religion, the Samaritans did. Some of their faith was a mixture of the law of Moses and some rituals from that mixed in with various other pagan religions and idolatry. And I guess the best verse that kind of summarizes the theology of the Samaritans is in 2 Kings chapter 17. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 33. The Bible says they feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. You say, Pastor, that verse is a, is a contradiction. I know. These people were living a contradictory life. They tried to blend the worship of Jehovah God with pagan cultures around them. Does that sound familiar or what? Isn't that exactly where Christianity is today? Let's blend sacred worship of God. Let's add in some of the elements of the world. Let's add in the musical style. Let's add in the cultural style and appropriate some of that and blend it in. And God will accept it, right? No. So there was this mixed worship. They feared God, but they also had their own gods after the pattern of the other nations around them. And so because of this, um, most Jews in the New Testament that we read about in Jesus' time, they despised the Samaritans. In fact, they despised the Samaritans even more than they despised the Gentiles, the Romans, and others. They looked down on the Samaritans as half-breeds, as idolaters, as pagan, as mis this mixed multitude. And so the Jews hated the Samaritans. In fact, if you uh, want to get a clearer picture of that, read John chapter 4 where Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman. And ah, the people that Jesus as a Jew, he should have hated and re rejected, he went to. And he won them for, for his sake. And so it's a, what you see in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman said, wait a minute, Jews have no dealings with us as Samaritans. By the way, also look at Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, and read the story of the good Samaritan. And you see that the Lord tries to make this point, who is our neighbor? Oh, what a lesson that we need to learn today. Who truly is our neighbor? Uh, the noise here was taking place here in our text in Ezra chapter 4 is these Samaritans heard this noise. Remember in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says that the people, well, verse 12 and 13, that as the temple started to be rebuilt, the people kind of assembled together, the old and the young, and they cried out. They cried out in joy, of course. But it talks about how the older people wept with a loud voice. And they wept with this loud voice, perhaps because they remembered the former glory of Solomon's temple 
And now this second temple is now being rebuilt. But that's what gets the attention of these early Samaritans. And so number one tonight, I want us to see, number one, the Samaritan proposal to the Jews. The Samaritan proposal to the Jews. Make no mistake, as we read Ezra chapter 4, it's very clear the intentions of the Samaritans. It's very clear that their true intentions was not to help the Jews, but to hinder the Jews in their work as they returned from exile. They offer the Israelites their services. Hey, we can, we can help you rebuild this temple. We seek God just like you seek God. Literally, we, we follow Jehovah just like you guys follow Jehovah. We know about Jehovah God. And they offered their help. But as we see through the rest of the chapter, the context, this was really more of an opportunity for how they can maybe hinder this work. Perhaps by being intimately involved, they can uh, they could kind of sabotage uh, this work. Uh, but I want you to understand this cooperation, had the Israelites agreed, this would have been an unholy alliance. And not, certainly not because of racial reasons, but always because of spiritual reasons. This would have been an unholy alliance. And right away we learn about the importance here of biblical separation. You know, God wants his people to be a distinct people and to serve him in a very distinct way. We are not of this world, and God's work is to be done God's way. God's work is to be done not in a worldly compromising fashion. It's to be done in accordance to what he's prescribed. And these, uh, this proposal of the Samaritans, we seek after God like you seek after God. Well, we saw in 2 Kings chapter 17, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. You try and serve Jehovah God and idols. And by the way, the, the insinuation here is that they off, they've been offering up sacrifices. Well, there hasn't been a temple in Jerusalem. Where, where have you been offering your sacrifices? Ah, oh, they had their own location. They, they created their own little system and religion. That, that's, that's unbiblical. That wasn't what God wanted them to do. And so these Samaritans here give us a lesson on what we should do when, when we're confronted with an opportunity to compromise. I want us to turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay, so this is a, a very clear principle in the Word of God. This is a very clear principle on separation. I want to emphasize that, sadly, some people have misinterpreted this verse and tried to use it for, to advance uh, unbiblical causes like racism and other things like that. But that clearly is not what God is describing here. That wasn't God's plan even in the Old Testament when he told the Jews not to marry pagan people. It was always spiritual. That was always the concerning. And clearly here, an unequal yoke is someone that's trying to follow after God and someone that's not trying to follow after God. How can two walk together except they be agreed? And the Bible gives us a principle here. A yoke is a joining together. It's literally an agricultural uh, tool that was used, and it was put around two ox to help plow a field. And an unequal yoke would be like having an ox and maybe a much smaller animal, a donkey or something, and well, it just wouldn't get the job done. In fact, what might happen is the ox might start going around in circles with the donkey. You make, you make no progress in your, in your goal there. And so what God is letting people know that in our unions as people, as Christians especially, we have to be very selective and very careful what we align ourselves with, who we associate with. I think there are things that we have to be careful. There's a sin of association. And that something may appear on the outside to look good, but as you dig deeper, it's sinful. We don't want to be associated with it. 
And we have to do our due diligence as Christians now more than ever. Listen, not everybody that shouts out certain slogans and phrases that may sound good, but when you dig deeper, not everything is of God that a Christian should hitch their wagon to. I'm talking about Black Lives Matter, of course. And listen, I've done my research, and you need to do yours as well. The Black Lives Matter organization, they're part of their founding uh, uh, founder's uh, goal is to bring in Marxism. You look it up on the internet, the interviews of their founders are lesbians and they want to advance Marxism. Marxism is anti-God, it's anti-biblical, it wants to do away with Christianity. Karl Marx hated Christians. Uh, their goal is to destroy the nuclear family. They want to destroy that concept of a, of a husband, a wife, raising their children together as a family. They hate that. And they have other wicked goals as well, I think, that take away from authority in our land and our country. But I think as Christians, we have to be careful. Who, who are we going to hitch our wagons to? And be careful who we associate with. I think certainly here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we think about things like marriage. I'm preaching especially to our young people that maybe you're praying about marriage. You're praying about who is that special someone for me. Well, I'm just going to tell you right now, you might as well put an X over someone that's not saved. I'm just going to save you a lot of time, and some ladies in here can tell you save you a lot of hardship, too. Amen. Might as well put a big, big X over someone that doesn't walk with God like you Amen. walk with God. Amen. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Certainly a marriage, a relationship like that, is an unequal yoke. Now, this is not really something that can be helped after you're already married, but certainly before you're married, as you're praying about your, your prospective spouse, husband, or wife. You say, Lord, I want someone that walks with you that's a believer like I'm a believer, that walks with you like I walk with you. That's the goal. And there's other applications here as well with an unequal yoke. But notice this separation here. Separation does not mean isolation, by the way. So it doesn't mean that I can't even look at someone that's not saved. I can't shake their hand. I can't wish them well. I can't uh, work alongside them in certain respects. No, the idea here is a joining together, a close-knit joining together. And things like, I think, like a marriage relationship, which is you don't, it doesn't get much closer than that. I think you can also apply this when people go into business, your business partners. I think it's wise to partner with uh, Christian people. I think that when you enter in commercial endeavors, you got to be careful. What if someone's not saved and they don't want to do taxes like you want to do taxes? They don't want to have moral, ethical things like you want to have moral, ethical things. It could be a big conflict there going into business with someone that's not saved. And there's other applications that perhaps the Holy Spirit can make for us as well. But clearly God wants us to be a separate people. And separation is two aspects, separating from and separating to. We're always separating from and to. And so sometimes we emphasize what we're separating from, but may we not overstate and neglect what we're separating to. We're separating ourselves to a relationship with God. So we're not missing out on anything when we separate from sin. You know, the world likes to tell young people, you'll miss out. Oh, you're going to miss out. You're going to separate from us. You're going to separate from this good time we're having. Oh, you're going to miss out. Oh, my Bible says quite contrarily. Listen, there's pleasure in sin for a season, but then there's regret. And, you know, it's a terrible thing to have to live a life with regret. You know, there's shame, there's hardship. Why bring those scars of sin on your life? No, you won't miss out on anything, but what you will have is a precious walk with the Lord. There's nothing that should, that should replace our walk with God. Nothing is worth sacrificing our walk and fellowship with our loving Heavenly Father. He wants to be a father to us. He wants to bless us and to encourage us. And he does that as, as we separate from and separate to. So there's this principle of biblical separation. But back in our text, back in Ezra chapter 4, the uh, early Samaritans here said, hey, we, we serve God. Sure, we believe in God too. But of course, this was uh, not entirely true. The modern day, by the way, ecumenical movement of today. The modern day ecumenical movement of today seeks to promote unity. That's the big buzzword is unity. And that might sound nice and warm and fuzzy, but unity has to be based on truth. Unity has to be based on truth. Listen, if you combine with someone that you, you say Jesus Christ is God, he's the only way to heaven, how can I enter into fellowship with someone that says he's not God? He's not, there are many ways to heaven. That, it doesn't make any sense. 
But that's the kind of nonsense that's happening in our world today, even in religious circles. So you have groups like the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, and, and the modern day uh, uh, Protestant mainline denominations like Methodists and, 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 and uh, Episcopalians and so on and so forth. All of these groups, hey, let's have unity, let's all get together. Uh, we'll have Catholics and Muslims and Hindus and everybody, we'll all just get together. We all serve the same God. No, we don't. No, there's the God of the Bible, then there's the God of people's imaginations, I think. We serve the God of the Bible. And so we can't buy into this lie of quote-unquote unity. Unity is always based on the truth. And where there's no truth, there can be no unity. There's compromise. I mentioned the world and the National Council of Churches. They are, they, what they've done, they trade, traded the, the real gospel for a social gospel. You look it up. They're all about just social gospel today. They're not about advancing the true gospel. Um, they have no problems of having homosexuals a part of their groups. In fact, the last major meeting of the World Council of Churches, they had a, a delegation from the largest, uh, largely uh, gay church in the world. They had their delegates come and lead singing, lead in worship, and give a speech. And that's terrible. That's wickedness. And they won't speak out against it. And even right now, the United Methodist Church, I know for a while, they were in this back and forth over this, this large sect that wanted to affirm uh, LGBTQ and all that homosexuality, all that sodomite stuff. And they wanted to affirm that there's this big battle. And to me, it's like, why, why even have a battle? Where's the question? Where's the debate? It's, it's, it's not debatable where God stands on these issues. And so I can't understand that someone that says I'm a Bible-believing Christian, you stay in that mess. I just can't understand it. By the way, every time you give to churches like that, you're not just giving to that one local body. You're giving to all of that. You're giving to all those wicked schools, wicked professors that don't believe the Bible. You're giving to all of that. So I can't understand why someone would stay in the mess. Come out from among them, the Bible says. I know it's uncomfortable. Well, I, I have family and I have relationships and connections in history. Listen, come out from among them because we're separating to, we're separating, uh, we're separating from, but we're also separating to, to God. We're going to honor God. We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to bring glory to the Lord. That's what biblical separation is about. This unity movement, it's based on a lie of universalism. We're all going to heaven. Many roads to heaven. Um, and sadly, it's crept its way into even the modern evangelical movement. I know that uh, men like Billy Graham and Franklin Graham have done a lot of good things. I appreciate their stand on a lot of areas. I appreciate the gospel that they preach. But sadly, especially Billy Graham in his, some of his early days, he compromised. He would hold his meetings and he would have liberal Christians on the platform. By liberal, I mean Christians, well, in name, who deny the fundamental truths of the Bible, that the Bible is the word of God, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus Christ is God. I mean, you can't, if you don't believe that you're not a Christian, you're, in fact, if you don't believe that you're anti-Christian, Jesus Christ is God. He was born of a virgin. The Bible is the word of God from cover to cover. But he allowed in his goal for reaching the masses, he, he compromised and allowed liberal ministers to come and speak at his meetings. He compromised with Roman Catholics. I think that's sad, I think it's tragic. Listen, everyone has, has uh, feet of clay. I know a lot of people revere Billy Graham, but there were some serious mistakes made that here in our church, we're not gonna go along with that stuff. It's sad when people compromise. It's sad when people kind of try to blend in the work of the Lord with wicked men. It can't be done, it shouldn't be done. Maybe you've seen that bumper sticker on a lot of people's bumper, coexist. Listen, that coexist, listen, that, at the end of that, I guess it's supposed to be a T, it's supposed to represent a cross, but everything that comes before it is opposed to the cross. Everything that comes before it, the, the Muslim, the Hindu, everything that comes before it is opposed to the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. Listen, we believe in walking in love. We're not going around antagonizing and attacking people. Everybody has the right to believe what they want to believe. They're going to answer to God for what they choose. But the reality here is when we're talking about engaging and co-laboring together in the work of the Lord, we can't compromise. It can't be done. Um, there's problems when people try and compromise. Uh, you water down your doctrine. You have to. You water down your doctrine. 
And you look at Jesus Christ and the apostles, they never watered down their doctrine. I'm sure they, they wanted unity. Christ wants unity, but he never changed and compromised the message for the sake of unity. Um, we send a mixed message to the world that we're saying that, hey, we, the Bible is really unimportant. You can kind of change it however you see fit. It's no big deal. You don't have to take a stand for anything. And we send this mixed message to the world when we compromise. So here in our text in Ezra chapter 4, what's happening here is a temptation for compromise. And for Israel to agree to this alliance would have been very dangerous and sinful. And to, so to the Samaritans, Yahweh, Jehovah, was really just one of many gods. And so that's why they could not enter into this work. And so they were idol worshipers. And so this would have been a very dangerous partnership. Um, so thankfully, in verse number three, the Bible says Zerubbabel and Jeshua uh, and all the leaders of Israel, they refuse this offer. Thanks, but no thanks. Praise the Lord for men of conviction that are willing to say no. And so they rejected this offer, even though it might have been helpful, perhaps. I'm sure they could have used the help. But again, we remember that we are not pragmatists in the work of the Lord. Pragmatism says the ends justify the means and so as long as the end hey the temple's built who cares how it happens hey the end hey we have tons of people in church who cares how it happens that's not the way God's work is done it's not pragmatic no from beginning to end it ought to be sanctified and holy and the goal is to bring glory to God the means and the ends both matter to God so we don't believe in pragmatism ah, whatever it takes who cares if it's sinful we, we, we change our doctrine a little bit no big deal but thankfully, that's not the way the Israelites were. They wanted to bring glory to God. They knew that doing this work, laboring together with wicked men, would not bring glory to God. We must not allow men of the world, men of sin, to engage hand in hand with us in the master's work. Now, I'll say a word about sometimes uh, there might be other, maybe we might say, I don't know if you call it secular causes that maybe we are for, and for example, as Christians, I believe many of us were all pro-life, that we believe that life begins at conception and we hate the sin of abortion. And sometimes maybe God might lead you to do something to st stand out and speak out for that. And sometimes in doing so, you'll find yourself shoulder to shoulder with Catholics and Muslims that believe on that issue the same thing. I don't necessarily have a, a huge problem with all of that. I think the Holy Spirit has to lead you. But when it comes to ministerial work, when it comes to the work of the Lord, I think there's a clear distinction here that we're not to partner with wicked people that are opposed to the truth of the Bible. Okay, so that's number one, the Samaritans offer. But number two, the Samaritans hostility. The Samaritans hostility. As soon as the offer was taken away, they showed their true colors. Oh, they tried their best to now thwart and defeat and divert the Israelites from completing this work in rebuilding the temple. And the Bible says they weaken their hands. They tried to weaken their hands. The Bible says in verse number five, and hired counselors against them to frustrate the purpose, their purpose. So literally they, they tried to maybe get some people to give them bad advice. Maybe even some of the, some of the supplies that they were getting from other countries, they told them, hey, don't work with the Israelites. Don't help, don't give them your timber. Don't give them your, your, your supplies, your work. And so they tried to subvert the work of God. And from really from verse 4 and uh, continuing to the end of the chapter, it's really a broad overview. What takes place really happens over several years. But this is a broad overview of the, uh, this work, that's this attempt to hinder the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And this section shows the Samaritan resistance that extends even to the days of Nehemiah. So the work of the building of the temple was interrupted for several years, and we see several kings mentioned. The Bible says in verse 6, in the reign of King Ahasuerus, if that sounds familiar, he reigned during the time of Esther. So that the Bible is showing us that time has now been passing by, and this work is being hindered. So it wasn't just like a one-day thing. It was years of opposition, years of this hindrance. How discouraging must that have been? But we see several kings mentioned, and just for history's sake, Ahasuerus reigned from 485 to 465 B.C., and then Artaxerxes reigned from 464 to 424 B.C. And even after the temple was finished, 
Under Zerubbabel, the Samaritans continued to oppose the rebuilding of the city and the walls around Jerusalem. So again, this was an ongoing hindrance. But the Bible uh, notes here in um, verse number 8 and following, they, even, they went to the leadership of the king to try and get the work to stop. And interestingly, from verse 8 through chapter 6, uh, through chapter 7, um, it's going to be written in Aramaic, actually. It's no longer in Hebrew. It's going to be in Aramaic, interestingly enough. Obviously translated in English for us in our King James Bible. But they send a letter to the king. And obviously it was translated by a Persian scribe, perhaps. But this letter showed their, their efforts to resist this work of God. And you see, you see some of their tactics. They said, hey, king, if you allow these people to build, rebuild their city, they're not going to pay taxes. You're going to miss out on revenue. Your tax base isn't going to be as strong anymore. And they said, listen, king, these people, they're not going to pay you tribute. They're not going to pay taxes to you. And, of course, that was actually a bold-faced lie. There was no indication that the Israelites intended to do that. But anything it took. Notice the devil's cry. They play dirty sometimes. Whatever it takes to hinder the work of God. And even if it's a bold-faced lie. I notice in verse 13 and 14, notice the language. And how they frame this letter it says, be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded, the walls set up again, they will not pay toll, tribute and custom. And thou shalt and damage the revenue of the kings. Now, because we have maintenance from the king's palace and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor. In other words, king, we want to we don't want to see you dishonored. King, we're, we're, we're with you on this, king. We're trying to help you here. And King, listen, we know what's going to bring you honor. We know what's going to bring you dishonor. If you allow these Israelites to continue, it's going to be a big problem for you. And you see how slick they are in trying to uh, uh, convince this king. And they have these skillfully crafted arguments here, this argument that these people look up their history. They used to have great and mighty kings, maybe referring to Solomon and David. And they used to take tribute from other nations, meaning, hey, this, this nation, this city, they were dangerous people. You better watch out. If you allow them to grow and become strong, they'll be a thorn in your side. You don't want that to happen, king. And they have all these skillfully crafted arguments. And it reminds us of our greatest enemy, Satan. Satan, his name literally means adversary. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that he is an accuser of the brethren. And you better believe that Satan will come to you and to me to whisper in our ear skillfully crafted arguments to discourage our service of the Lord. Oh, he'll bring things up from your past, your history. He'll say, hey, don't you remember? Look back at the record of your lifestyle. How, how dare you think you can serve God? Don't you remember what you did in X year and what you did and how you did that? And we need to remember that. In Christ, it's all under the blood. There's now, therefore, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. But the devil doesn't want us to, to think of God's grace, God's mercy. He wants us to only think about how terrible we are and how we can't do anything for the Lord. You know, I believe that the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin, but it'll always give you hope. The Holy Spirit always gives hope that I can find forgiveness, restoration. But the devil brings de uh, depression. The devil doesn't bring conviction of sin. He brings you're hopeless, there's no hope, you're nothing, you're good for nothing. You ought to be discerning of the voices. The Holy Spirit, yes, will convince you of sin. But Satan wants to just keep you down. He doesn't want you to get up and serve God. And that's what was happening here. And then number three, thirdly, the temporary triumph of the wicked. In verses 17 through 24, we see the response of the king uh, to this letter. And it appears the Samaritan adversaries were successful. Artaxerxes, king of Persia, probably the most powerful man in the world. He commands that this work cease, that the work be stopped. And it seemed like the work would cease for now. Remember, as I said before earlier in my sermon, that Satan cannot defeat the work of God. He can only delay the work of God. The Bible says in verse 24, Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia, meaning it would pick up again. God had a purpose in allowing this persecution, 
God had a purpose in allowing this opposition. Perhaps it was to strengthen the resolve of these people. Perhaps he was even to test them. Remember their biggest sin before was idolatry. They loved to go after all the other gods. Perhaps God was, te was testing their faithfulness, their resolve. But certainly God's work would not be completely defeated. Well, I think a lot of lessons we can take from this chapter, as I mentioned before, the danger of compromising in our ministry and serving the Lord, in our relationships, in our associations in life. We need to be very cautious and careful. We need to always remember that whenever we decide to serve God, there will be opposition. Sometimes the opposition is from a familiar face. Maybe it's people that you love that are near and dear to you. Don't let that discourage you. Don't let that keep you down. We need to always keep our eyes on the Lord. We're serving him. We're not serving them. We're not even serving ourselves. You're not serving uh, me as the pastor. We're all in this to serve the Lord. It's the Lord's work. It's going to be done his way. And may we rejoice tonight that we are not uh, building a physical temple because the Bible says in the New Testament age, we are the temple. In fact, 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says that we are literally living stones. We are a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. We are a part of this marvelous temple that God inhabits, his presence inhabits. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You and I are that church tonight. Isn't it encouraging? That no matter how dark the days may seem, we can cling to that promise. The gates of hell should not prevail against it. Or oh, we can rejoice that Christ is doing a greater work in and through us. And not, not with clay and stone, but with us, with our lives. May we be willing vessels, allowing him to use us towards that end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for these examples in your word, these principles that we can glean and apply to our lives. Oh, Lord, help us to not compromise in our faith, in our walk with you, in our convictions. Lord, help us to take a stand, to be bold. Lord, we're living in a day that preaches tolerance, but really the tolerance of this age is intolerance to the gospel. Lord, give us wisdom and grace how to navigate through all of that. Lord, I pray that as your people, we wouldn't allow your work to be hindered that we would, with patience, with love, with mercy, continue pressing on to do what you've called us to do. Lord, help us not to be discouraged. Help us not to let the enemy distract us and divert our attention from what matters the most, getting the gospel out, seeing the church of Jesus Christ advanced. And Lord, I pray you continue to build us up towards that end. With heads bowed and eyes closed tonight, as we continue in prayer, I'm going to ask our pianist to play through a hymn, a hymn of invitation tonight. And tonight I want us to pray for churches like ours across our nation. I want us to pray that the work of God does not cease. And we know it won't. We pray against the, those that would seek to oppose the work of God. We need to hold these folks in prayer. Hold our own church in prayer. You better believe that the devil has a target on churches like ours that doesn't compromise, that preaches the gospel, that seeks to do our best to serve the Lord. And so we have to pray against those that would seek to oppose these adversaries. And then maybe there's individual circumstances in your personal life where people oppose you, friends, family, others. Oh, may God give us boldness and courage.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the work that you're doing in our day and age. Lord, you're always doing a work. And Lord, primarily your work in this day and age is through local New Testament churches. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen churches across the world, Lord, that you would help us to let our lights shine for you. Would you protect our church here, Lord, protect us against uh, the dangers of compromise and wickedness, would help us to stay by the book and to be faithful to the work, Lord. Would you continue opening up doors for us to advance the gospel and make disciples? Lord, we pray for churches here in our nation. We think especially in the state of California, many churches that are under fierce persecution even in this hour. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give them uh, the strength they need, Lord, and the wisdom they need to navigate through this, Lord. Help them to have courage and boldness. Lord, would you open up doors for them? We pray against, Lord, those that would seek to hinder your work. Father, we pray you'd open up the door for ministry. Lord, we think of uh, the little persecution, really, that we face here in our country. Lord, I pray that it wouldn't shock us or surprise us, but that we would know that it's par for the course. Lord, that we would know that throughout history, there's always been opposition to the work of God. And Lord, that we would rejoice that whenever there was opposition, the work of God actually flourished and grew even more. Lord, I pray that you would prove yourself even during these times in our nation's history. Lord, we pray that you would just continue to help the gospel light to shine in a world that needs to see it now more than ever. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to have conviction, have strength, and have resolve to be committed, to be faithful, to be obedient in this wonderful work, the greatest work there is in getting the gospel out. Even this week, Lord, Give us boldness and wisdom and opportunities and divine appointments to be able to share Christ. And so, Father, we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and let's sing number 430 tonight before we depart. Let's sing the windows of heaven are open. One of our favorite courses around here. We'll sing the windows of heaven are open. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart, since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment, he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy to. Let's remain standing. Let's close in prayer. Ask God to guide us. Father, thank you for these moments we've had together in your house. I pray that you would help us not to just be hearers, but to be doers. Go before us this week. Keep us safe in all that we do. We pray again for those opportunities to be able to share Christ and bring us back safely for the next appointed meeting we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.